what hurts me the most is for two patients to accuse me of giving uh, another patient's medication that was not ordered. When we leave our loved ones under the medical care of others, we expect them to be treated with kindness, professionalism, and even some form of love. Imagine though for a moment what you would do if your special person came to harm, and even worse, if it wasn't by accident. This is Dark Case Serial Killers. Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join the quickly growing, incredibly supportive Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Remember, choosing to be kind can save a life in many ways. Thank you so much for choosing to be here with me. Our love and respect goes out to all those affected by this case. Clara Strange and Thelma Metcalf were two friends, but they doubled as dialysis patients at the DeVita Lufkin Dialysis Centre. They had met at the care facility and quickly became buddies as their gruelling days at the centre dragged on. Clara was 77 years old and known as a sweet, loving woman. She devoted her life to her husband, children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. She was also dedicated in her career as a teacher at Lufkin State School. This was an educational facility for intellectually disabled students. Clara also made time for herself, enjoying quilting, cooking and any adventure that she could muster up the strength to participate in. She was lovingly known by her family and as an easygoing adventurer, a combination I think we can all aspire to. It is no surprise that Clara got along so well with 68-year-old Thelma, who was virtually no different. Thelma's family members called her a loving jokester, her mother and grandmother who was also up for any adventure that came her way. She was extremely social, always going to some type of group, class or party, so long as her physical strength could keep up. Thelma didn't want to let her age or her health problems stop her from experiencing life, so she did the best she could to live every day to the fullest. Thelma had a long history of both diabetes and hypertension. These both began to affect her social life as they worsened. Even though it was difficult for her to adjust, Thelma's family was extremely supportive as she experienced declining health. Her daughter-in-law was doing her best to care for her as she was a registered nurse. However, once Thelma's condition began to affect her kidneys, it was obvious that she needed help that her family just could not provide. As it became abundantly clear that Thelma needed to start dialysis, she lost hope in her ability to ever do things that she loved again, including her bustling social life. Even though she was missing out on what she used to have, Thelma was pleasantly surprised at the community she found when she began her visits to DeVita. With friends like Clara and nurses that made her feel like part of her family, it was easier for her to cope with the loss of social interaction that she used to have. Her family was delighted at first because when Thelma had to visit the centre every Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday, she continued to feel more and more at home in the family she found at DeVita. She was so pleased with the emotional and social treatment that she was receiving that she was happy to ignore her family's concerns about the quality of her physical treatment. Thelma experienced a lot of setbacks during her time at DeVita, way more than what is typical of a dialysis patient. Her family said that she just had one problem after the other. Dialysis treatments are definitely not a painless experience. While receiving dialysis, patients can experience a myriad of side effects. These include anemia, muscle cramps, low blood pressure and an itching sensation. It can be very painful as standard. So was Thelma's family overreacting. Although Thelma was experiencing these 
so-called normal symptoms, she had frequent visits to the emergency room. There, she reported extreme pain in her limbs, more than the usual cramping that a patient can experience. During these visits, the doctors would tell Thelma and her family that she must have received too much heparin during her treatment. This was known to be something that can happen sometimes, but not as often as it happened to Thelma. Heparin is a blood thinner that is an essential part of the dialysis process, being injected with a syringe into the IV lines of the dialysis patients. Thelma would continuously have episodes of extreme pain and discomfort, so much so that at one point she woke up without being able to move or talk. This time something was happening that was definitely not normal. Dialysis patients should never experience paralysis as a result of their treatment. This time when she visited the emergency room for her loss of feeling in her limbs, the doctors said that she had received so much heparin that it had permeated her spinal fluid. This essentially partially paralysed her. Thelma's family thought that this had to be medical malpractice, but they were wary of accusing anyone of administering too much heparin to her repeatedly. After all, Thelma's daughter-in-law was a registered nurse. She for one didn't want to believe that a fellow nurse could be so negligent. When they tried to find another healthcare provider for Thelma, she simply didn't want to leave. She loved the community that she had at DeVita so much, it was impossible for her to see that anyone could be lacking in the medical capacity to help her. The family, trying not to fight with Thelma, contacted the DeVita Center. They wanted answers. Their calls, however, went unanswered, left in the dark on what could be happening to their beloved mother and grandmother. And once Thelma's family heard of a recall on heparin, they all relaxed. The faulty heparin must have been the cause of the episodes that Thelma was experiencing. They were glad that they didn't have to cause a nurse to lose her job over these incidents. But on April the First, Thelma was experiencing something different than she normally did at the centre. As she was receiving her treatments, she initially felt the normal side effects that anyone would feel when receiving dialysis. But after a while, she told the nurse it was a sign to her that she felt funny. Following her statement, she immediately went into cardiac arrest. Her heart had stopped beating and the nurses swiftly intervened. While one called 911, the others attempted to give her CPR, hoping to restart her heart. She was rushed to the emergency room where they hoped that the doctors would be able to save her life. But before Thelma's family could get to the hospital, she had sadly passed away. As they processed the sudden and devastating loss of Thelma, they grew angry that the DeVita Center didn't call them sooner. Maybe they could have gotten there in time, maybe they could have been able to say goodbye. They wanted to get all the information they could about what had happened. They needed answers. The family had spoken with hospital personnel about the events surrounding her arrival at the emergency room. They detailed how Thelma had experienced heart complications as a result of her dialysis treatments. But the staff were slightly unsettled that Thelma was the third patient that had arrived from DeVita that day. All of these patients had experienced the same symptoms. To their surprise, Thelma's good friend friend, Clara Strange, had arrived at the hospital 30 minutes earlier. As the family took in this information, they tried to process what it meant for their own mother. They inquired about Clara, knowing that Thelma was good friends with her. Shocking the family even more, Clara had also passed away, again from cardiac arrest. It all seemed almost too coincidental, and the news of the parallels between Clara and Thelma left a strange feeling in the stomachs of Thelma's family. Even though it was a strange occurrence, everyone needed to grieve. And grieve without thinking about looking into the situation further. The DeVita Dialysis Center's mission is to build the greatest healthcare community the world has ever seen. DeVita offers treatment plans that meet all stages of kidney disease, with their main services being dialysis treatments. Patients are hooked up to machines through IVs for hours of the day, while the dialysis machine removes blood from their body, filters it and returns it back into the bloodstream, a process that the kidneys alone can no longer perform. Because of the prolonged, painful and repeated experience that the patients have to endure, the nurses have a very important job in these centres. These nurses, at the very minimum, provide healthcare, but are considered even more skilled when they are able to make the countless hours more enjoyable by 
telling jokes, reading them stories, or simply sitting and talking with them. Patients have commented on their experience at DeVita, saying that they truly felt like family whilst being there, quoting feeling valued and like a whole person and not just a patient. Although DeVita has many locations, the centre of the shocking, unimaginable occurrences that took place is their location in Lufkin, Texas. Lufkin is a scenic beauty of its state, with many qualities to offer. People that live there say that although it is a larger community, it is close-knit. If you go to the grocery store, it's likely you'll see someone that you know. No one expected such a tragedy to occur in their tranquil community. It was a normal day of work at the DeVita Centre on April the 1st, 2008. Patients were receiving their treatments, talking with nurses, and making the most of the otherwise painful day. As the centre began to recover from the tragedy of two beautiful souls being lost, they tried to continue business as usual. Garlin Kelly Jr. was another favourite in the DeVita clinic. Sharon Dearman, a nurse at the centre, stated that he was a joy to be around, adding he was one of her favourite patients to hang out with. She enjoyed it when she saw him come into the centre. Outside of providing his medical care, he talked with her, laughed with her and shared stories that would make her smile. Another patient of DeVita, Carolyn Reisinger, said that Garlin was a really sweet man. Garlin was a light and beacon of happiness that radiated throughout the facility, positively affecting everyone that he came into contact with. On April the 16th, Garlin was at the centre for his routine round of dialysis care. After Sharon ensured that Garlin was comfortable and that everything was running smoothly, she took a short break. On her break, she heard a sound that had become entirely too familiar at DeVita, the dialyzer alarm. The alarm on the dialysis machine sounds whenever there is something wrong with the lines that transport the fluids, or if there is no blood flowing back into the patient from the machine. As she rushed back into the room, her beloved patient Garlin was suffering a cardiac episode. Sharon heard him utter the words, what did you give me? Sharon looked at the lines to try and figure out what had caused this reaction, when she noticed a large, black, stringy ball in his dialysis line, saying that she thought it was a hairball. The incidence of Garlin's cardiac episode was happening over a matter of seconds. Sharon didn't have time to think of what she saw and why she was seeing it or how to react. He was immediately transported to the hospital, and although he was resuscitated, his body and brain had endured too much to survive. Unlike with Thelma, Garlin's family was able to visit before his passing, although sadly by this stage he could not speak to them. If he could, this whole thing may have been over much sooner. Garlin Kelly would never regain consciousness after that day and would pass in August of 2008. Nurse Sharon Dearman was greatly affected by Garlin's passing, expressing that she experienced a great sadness for a long time after his loss. She had to carry on and be the nurse that her other patients needed her to be. The occurrences of cardiac arrest was cause for serious concern. Only one in 180,000 patients experienced heart problems as a result of dialysis treatments. The DeVita Dialysis Centre had experienced three deaths in a matter of just two weeks. There were also other patients experiencing unusual complications. They knew that something was wrong. DeVita couldn't explain the amount of patients that were having extremely adverse reactions to their treatments. They decided to launch an internal investigation. They began to collect all the heparin, dialysis lines and water that was used during the treatment cycles. They tested the water, ensured that the heparin was being administered correctly, and tested the dialysis lines for contaminants. But they found nothing. The only physical evidence that was strange was that some nurses reported their machines behaving strangely at times. They made weird noises or demonstrated small mechanical or electrical hiccups, but this was nothing that would cause this kind of distress to patients. Feeling confident in their own investigation, they cautiously kept their doors open. Patient Cora Bryant had no idea that a seemingly routine day at the clinic would end so tragically. She arrived for her usual dialysis treatment on April the 22nd, but she experienced complications from the very beginning. Initially, she was experiencing blood clotting. This alone is not a completely abnormal thing to happen during a round of dialysis, and it can be easily corrected. This is a necessity of heparin. 
Cora's lines were replaced by her nurse, Martha Mann, and her treatment continued. When Martha went on break, the beeping of the dialysis machine alarm sounded. She hurried back into the room and saw that Cora was stable, watching TV and trying to relax. Martha breathed a sigh of relief as her associate, Candice Lackey, said that the reason for the alarm was because another nurse was resetting Cora's dialysis machine. However, when Nurse Lackey returned, the fluid from the machine was pushed back into Cora's body. She immediately went into cardiac arrest. She never regained consciousness and passed away in July of 2008. It seemed that DeVita was experiencing a particularly unusual bout of bad luck with patients. That was the only explanation that they could think of anyway. They had tested everything that they could possibly test, sure that there was nothing they could be doing that was causing this to happen. Although it wasn't terribly common for them to to experience cardiac arrests, it did happen. And maybe this was just a spike in the statistics. Others began to take notice of the seemingly disproportionate tragedies that were occurring in their loving medical community. People thought that there was no possible way that this could be a coincidence, but what could they do? Opal Few was a 91-year-old woman with a young heart. She told the nurses that they were beautiful every day that she walked into the DeVita clinic, and the nurses said that she was the sweetest pea. The nurses were rooting for her, and it seemed like she was greatly improving until the day of April the 26th. Just like the previous times, her nurses went on a break. Then the alarm sounded, and Opal's life ended almost immediately. The nurses took her passing very hard. Hard. They would miss the positive energy she brought to the clinic, but they worked hard to provide the best care possible despite their grieving of Opal. Just two days later, the mystery of the numerous complications would begin to be revealed. On April the 28th, Lurleen Hamilton and Linda Hall were sitting next to each other whilst receiving their dialysis treatments. They talked, laughed and reminisced about their earlier days before they spent their time sitting at DeVita. It was then that Lurleen saw a nurse enter the room with a bucket. A bucket that the employees normally filled with a mixture of water and bleach to disinfect the patient areas. She didn't think anything of it. The nurse was likely getting ready to clean an area that a patient had just left. However, Hamilton was shocked when she watched the nurse pull a syringe out of her pocket. She dipped it into the bucket, filled it with liquid, and then put it back into her jacket. She then walked over to a patient, took the syringe out of her jacket, and injected its contents into the IV line. She then disposed of the syringe into the sharps bin. Sharp spins are medical disposal bins that are commonly used in hospitals and other medical facilities. Physicians, nurses and healthcare workers dispose of syringes, empty IV bags or used vials. The waste is then later normally incinerated. The patient that the nurse injected was Marva Roan. She would almost immediately experience a severe drop in blood pressure. As she continued to watch the nurse in horror, patient Linda Hall watched the same nurse perform the same act, this time on patient Carolyn Reisinger. Reisinger also experienced an extreme drop in blood pressure, recording yet another incident of complications for the clinic. Both patients, Hall and Hamilton, were left in complete disbelief. They knew they couldn't leave it unreported. Although Hall was fearful of what the nurse would do if they told about what they saw, Hamilton had no hesitation. They both told another employee about what they had seen that day. The nurse that the two identified as committing the horrifying acts was Kimberly Signs. When the DeVita administration heard about what happened, they didn't want to overreact. So, perhaps surprisingly, the police weren't called. They swiftly collected the two sharp spins where Kimberly had allegedly disposed of the syringes, testing them for the presence of bleach. When the test came back positive, they knew they needed outside help. Kimberly was immediately sent home, and the doors to the clinic were closed so the police could investigate. When the police first became involved, they were investigating malpractice. This means that they thought one of the nurses were negligent, resulting in the distress of patients. They did not think what had happened was deliberate. Despite this notion, they processed the clinic as if it were a crime scene. They collected 
collected anything they thought they would need for their investigation, including all of the sharps bins and used IV lines from the month of April. To the extreme aid of the police, the administrators of the Vita had saved all the IV lines of the patients who had suffered cardiac distress during their treatments. And even better, the IV line of Garlin Kelly had a syringe still attached to it. The Lufkin police were so efficient in their investigation that they knew that they were underprepared for this type of analysis. They partnered up with the CDC's epidemiology team. This is a branch that deals with the presence of disease or other things that can affect someone's health. With the team put together, they began combing through the medical charts from the month of April. They tested everything that they had collected. Everything that Kimberly had used, every tube and syringe of the five patients that had passed away, tested positive for bleach. They also examined the charts of those who had experienced extreme distress or passed away, looking for anything out of the ordinary. During this search, they had found correlative evidence that was too obvious to ignore. Kimberly Signs was listed as a technician on every single chart that attended in pain and suffering. They now knew that they had to talk to Kimberly. Kimberly's interview was strange to say the least. The point of the interview was not necessarily to get her to confess, but more so to gain as much insight as possible into what happened during each incident. The truth was, they didn't have a ton of information about what had happened happened besides the two witnesses who saw her, and that wasn't nearly enough. They tried to have a completely non-accusatory attitude, making it clear that they were only talking to her to gain information on the events. However, very early on in the interview, Kimberly brought up how she had been accused of hurting patients, and that she was extremely upset about it. What hurts me the most is for two patients to accuse me of giving uh, another patient's medication that was not order. The police were taken aback. They had not even referenced the fact that she could be involved in the harm of the DeVita patients. Rookie error on Kimberly's part. So the interviewers gave her the space to tell her side of the story. Kimberly said that she did in fact inject a fluid into the IV lines of those patients, but it wasn't bleach. Saline is commonly used as a temporary treatment for cramping. Cramping is a side effect of the dialysis cycle. In response to this, the investigators asked Kimberly what she thought happened to those patients patients, and her explanation was a cause for concern. According to Kimberly, she believed that the reason these patients went into cardiac arrest was because of the presence of renalin in the dialysis machines. Renalin is a common steriliser used in these machines. It circulates throughout the machine to keep the internal mechanics of it clean and sterile. Kimberly said that if the renalin somehow interferes with the IV lines of the patient, it's like bleach going into their body. The the investigators were perplexed by this statement. She had been the one to bring up the presence of bleach, and this made them question whether she knew what was happening to these patients all along. As they continued to question her, the interview became even stranger. She began slurring her words, losing focus, and continuously looking at her phone. While the investigators continued speaking with her, it became abundantly clear that she was under the influence of something. There was no point in speaking with her any longer. Police decided to end the interview as Kimberly became almost incoherent. The fact that she was not able to endure a police interview while sober caused them to question whether she was truly capable of providing quality medical care to anyone. They now knew they had to take a look at Kimberly's past. When researching any previous incidents that Kimberly had, they found plenty to choose from. She had been fired from multiple previous healthcare positions, one of which for allegedly stealing prescription medications and being under the influence at work. As the investigators uncovered more information, it only compelled them to look further. She had a long history of domestic violence, divorce, and substance issues. Kimberly Signs became a very strong candidate for their mistreatment of patients, but now, they needed evidence. So far, the only thing they had was her name listed on those charts and her record, along with her own alarming testimony. All of this evidence was correlative, but it could not be used to formally accuse her of anything. That is, until they received an interesting phone call. 
the Lufkin police received a call from a divorce lawyer who was aware of their investigation. According to the lawyer, Kimberly's husband had called him to inquire about filing for divorce from his wife. The investigators saw an opportunity and they took it. Without wasting any time, they hurried to speak to Kimberly's soon-to-be ex-husband. Again, they wanted to tread carefully with a mission to gain access to the couple's home or computer. To their delight, Kimberly's husband gave the police permission to examine Kimberly's computer history, and what they found was disturbing. Kimberly had conducted internet searches in the middle of the night with the following keywords, bleach detection and bleach effects on the bloodstream. The police investigators began to realise that this was not a case of malpractice. This was intentional. Kimberly Signs was far more dangerous than they initially thought, but they knew that this case would be very, very tricky to prove. Although they now had Kimberly's search history, it was all still coincidental. They needed cold, hard evidence to put her behind bars for the unthinkable things that she had done, and they needed help to do it. The investigators knew that they needed to scientifically prove that Kimberly's injections had directly caused the passing or physical distress of each patient. They brought nursing textbooks, combing through them to educate themselves as much as possible in the little time that they had. Once they had a general understanding, they went to a hospital to conduct some experiments. They had to figure out how the bleach injections would have affected the patients. So they injected a syringe of bleach into a vial of blood. When they did this, the vial instantly turned black, coagulating into a solid mass, kind of appearing like a hairball. The police realised that this was the exact thing that Sharon Dimon reported seeing in Garland Kelly's IV line during his cardiac arrest. As they researched the cause of this, they found that the introduction of blood was causing the red blood cells to burst, releasing iron and producing the black mass that they were seeing in the vial. They realised that these patients experienced the red blood cells of their entire body bursting at the same time. Even worse, the release of iron into the bloodstream causes a burning sensation. Kimberly had lit a fire inside of these patients' bodies. Although this evidence was extremely important, it was was still the same as all the other evidence they had, circumstantial. This evidence would convince someone of, if the shoe fits, wear it, but that's not enough for the American legal system. There has to be proof beyond a reasonable doubt. The only way that they could definitively prove Kimberly's guilt was to prove that the bleach actually entered the bloodstream of Kimberly's patients, causing the reaction that occurred in the hospital vial. But how could they prove it? They needed to test the blood of the patients for the presence of bleach, but such a test didn't exist. After all, why would it? A medical researcher would never think to test the theory of does injected bleach harm people? It obviously would. Number one, it would be extremely inhumane to research, and number two, what would be the necessity for it? Hope at this time was all but lost. Until that is, the CDC introduced the Lufkin Police Department to someone who could do the impossible. The Bioterrorism Council was established to evaluate the possible methods that other countries could use to induce havoc in America, namely chemical warfare. Coincidentally, the council was conducting research on the possibility and effects of using chlorine gases as a method of warfare. They had just developed the chlorotyrosine test. This tests for an amino acid that is not naturally present in the body, but it is present in chlorine and in bleach. Therefore, they were able to test the blood, proving whether bleach had been introduced or not. When this news broke, the Lufkin police scrambled to put together blood tests of all kinds for the council's experimentation. Overall, they sent 51 samples, some of which were non-dialysis patients, some of which were, and nine of them were the samples of the victims of Kimberly signs. When the test was conducted on all 51 samples that were sent, only a small number of them tested positive. How many do you think that was? Nine, to be exact. Against all odds, the police had gotten their proof and it was time to bring Kimberly to justice. The general consensus was that Kimberly began with the over-injection of heparin, 
This would explain the numerous complications that both Clara Strange and Thelma Metcalf experienced before their passing. The unfortunate truth here is that Clara and Thelma were the guinea pigs in Kimberly's wicked experiments, pawns in her perfection of her sinister craft. She was arrested and charged with ending the lives of five people in addition to assaulting five others. Thelma's family reported feeling extremely angry about the entire situation, especially since they found out about it through the newspapers and not the police. They had read the gruesome headline of Kimberly's crimes, seeing their mother's name printed as the second of her ten victims. The trial would prove to be extremely stressful for all parties involved. The police were nervous that they didn't have enough evidence, and the families were trembling at the thought of facing the woman that had destroyed their lives. Thelma's family members reported constantly seeing Kimberly smiling, laughing, and gleefully talking with her team before the trial. Even if she was innocent, why would she be doing this? They were disgusted with Kimberly's extreme lack of remorse or respect for the situation in which she had found herself. Did her defence team have any conscience at all? Sometimes you have to wonder. As the trial began, the team had many methods of defending Kimberly's actions. The first being to tear down the testimony of Linda Hall and Lurleen Hamilton who saw her draw bleach into a syringe. Kimberly's defence lawyer talked about how it was customary for the employees at DeVita to mix bleach and water. They did this in order to clean and sanitise the surfaces in the centre. Furthermore, it was extremely important that the nurses used a specific ratio of bleach to water. This required them to measure out the amount of bleach to mix, 10 cc's to be exact. Even though it was customary for the nurses to use a measuring cup to measure out the bleach, Kimberly's defence stated that it wasn't a requirement at DeVita to do so, and that it wasn't far-fetched for Kimberly to use a syringe as a measuring tool. The point of this defence was to say that what the witnesses saw was Kimberly simply measuring out the bleach for cleaning purposes, and that she could have thrown it out and used a different syringe to inject saline into the patient's IV lines. The problem with this defence was that the police asked her this question during her her initial interview. When they asked her what the procedure was for making the cleaning supply, Kimberly stated that they specifically used a measuring cup to measure out the bleach, not a syringe. If it was normal for her to use a syringe in this manner, she would have said that in her explanation. Furthermore, the witnesses also reported that Kimberly never input any information onto the patient's chart, nor did she enter information into the computer after injecting the fluid into their lines. This is important since nurses are required to record any medication that is administered to a patient on their chart and Kimberly didn't do this. The prosecution also asked, if not Kimberly, then what happened? When it came time for the defence to explain what they thought had happened, they blamed DeVita. According to them, the cause of death in the patient was likely the lack of filtration in the water that DeVita was using at the facility. This was something that the prosecution never even considered or thought to test during their initial investigation. Although DeVita had tested their water way before the police investigation was launched, it was too far in the past to hold up during the trial. Anxiety Anxiety set in. They couldn't possibly lose this case over these claims, and they had to think quickly to debunk these claims of dirty water. The prosecution adjusted quickly, ready to kick down this faulty hypothesis. If the problem was the inadequate water filtration, why were there only 10 patients affected out of the hundreds that they helped? Furthermore, has there been a case of cardiac arrest as a result of unfiltered water? Even though they had no expert to support their claims, the prosecution put their faith in the logical reasoning of the jury, knowing that unfiltered water does not cause cardiac arrest. Finally, the defence argued that the prosecution had no proof that the patient's passings were directly caused from the injection of bleach. Although it was present in their blood, they couldn't prove that the bleach caused the patients to end up in the morgue. Defence lawyers produced an expert witness, a medical examiner that had some choice words for the prosecuting team. She stated that if they really wanted to prove Kimberly's guilt, they would have exhumed all the patients who passed away and performed autopsies on them, proving that each passing was a 
direct result of the presence of bleach in their bloodstream. The medical examiner spewed that the prosecuting lawyers didn't do this, that they were trying to avoid the truth and dodge providing concrete proof. Onlookers and those affected by the awful acts of Kimberly drew weary. They thought that there wasn't enough evidence that Kimberly would walk free. But yet again, the prosecution thought on their feet in response to this expert witness. As a rebuttal, the prosecution provided the death certificates of each victim to the medical examiner, asking her to read what the families chose to do with them in preparation for their burial. As she read the word cremated, it quickly became clear that the investigators and lawyers were not avoiding the truth. It was impossible to conduct an autopsy on a pile of ash. Even though the prosecution was able to dodge everything the defence threw at them, the arguments on both sides were still extremely strong. The two days that it took the jury to deliberate were torturous for the prosecution lawyers, police investigators and families affected. They hoped that they had done enough that every night studying nursing textbooks, every experiment they conducted and every expert they talked to was worth it to keep Kimberly from ever hurting another person again. As the guilty verdict was read, a huge sense of relief was cast over the entire room. Justice was near. Even though she received a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole, it was still hard to swallow the pain that the aftermath brought. Not only did the family struggle to come to terms with the tragedies that had occurred, the other nurses of the centre were shocked at the sinister nature of one of their co-workers. They couldn't fathom that someone would have the desire or capability to do this. But as they looked back, they saw signs that they didn't see before. Kimberly was a technician that was assigned to Opal Few. Kimberly had taken a break to smoke a cigarette when Opal went into cardiac arrest, and when a nurse ran outside to tell her what was happening, Kimberly said that she would come in after she had finished her cigarette. That would have been very alarming, as any good nurse would drop everything upon hearing that a patient had coded. But Kimberly didn't, and now the nurses knew why. As Kimberly and her defence team filed numerous appeals to her sentence over the years, people began to take sides on the entire situation. Some people believed that DeVita was partially to blame for the disasters that had taken place, and others thought that the administrators did everything they could to protect their patients. This was just one rogue evil person. People are quoted as saying that they believe DeVita should have acted faster, and even though they claimed to be the best of the best, they failed to take notice of Kimberly's record where she had been fired from previous healthcare facilities for very serious reasons. Despite the difference of opinions, everyone agreed on one essential question. Why? What was the reason behind Kimberly's gruesome acts? Was it a saviour complex that failed? After all, other technicians at the centre saw Kimberly attempt to perform CPR, but they had to intervene when she failed to do it correctly. It was a question that would go unanswered regardless of the countless theories. The families of the victims choose to put these questions to rest, doing their best to move on. They are all doing their best to remember their beloved family members for the lives that they lived and the legacies that they leave. Do you think the punishment fits the crimes here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Let me know down in the comments. Please do hit like if you appreciate what I'm doing here. Thank you to everyone in the Dark Case crew, you too can become a channel member for just 99 pence. A huge thank you to my patrons, your support makes a massive difference. You too can support my work and be thanked in every video for just $5 per month. So a huge thank you to Rachel David, Kathy Green, David James, Addy Alexander, Karen Jones, El Palmieri, James Harrington, Shane Woodward, Faster River, Stacey Crogerus, Summer Chambers, Mona Corona, Cepheid Variable, Anthony Watson, Jason Coward, Guardian Paler, Jeremy Sebronek, Joy Burton, Dawn Croc, Michelle Mims, Natalie Lundquist, and Darlene. Be careful out there, and I'll see you soon.